So at last, we're at the final furlong and the viaduct's complete. Well, nearly. And I'm incredibly grateful to that scenic god, Luke Towan, for his inspiration and some of the ideas that I've used on this layout. So the landform's now complete and, I've, as usual, I've used Celotex. Um, it's not uh, a very nice uh, commodity to work with. It does have an irritant in it and you do need to wear um, protective gloves. And these gloves are from Dial, which is a, a B&Q um, product, and they're powder free. Now, in case you don't know what powder free means, it means that if you put them on without the powder, they tend to split. So you need to go and get some talc to make them go on properly. Obviously they should go straight on, but uh, rest assured, if they start splitting, it's because you need to go up into your wife's uh, boudoir and steal some talc. I've glued this together as usual with a, a good old um, Bosch glue gun. The only problem I had, did have was um, when I was using the glue gun and obviously you coat the ends and stuff and you pop it into place, I kind of give it a little bit of a, um, a juggle and this mark here really isn't the effect of me having a cold, it's actually the glue and I've absolutely ruined this t-shirt. But then that's why we wear old clothes for when we do our modelling, hopefully. Anyway, so I'm going to crack on with this now. Um, the, f the first thing I'm going to do is use good old sculptor mould um, to give the land um, some kind of uh, texture um, on both sides and then it will be a case of sorting out the river, painting the landform once the sculptor moulds dry um, and then I'll crack on from there. I've also done the points um, which I showed you in the last video which I cocked up um, because I took a trowel and broke off the frog wires so the new points are in, I've tested those um, because the tortoise point motors here aren't very accessible so I wanted to get those thoroughly tested before I went any further and it all looks good to go. So out with the sculptor mould. I'd appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel. I notice that actually only about 25% of my viewers do. And also, if you click the little bell icon, then you'll get a notification when the next video is released. The sculptor mould really is a straightforward product to use. It's not unlike paper mache, and I kind of mix it with uh, three fistfuls of sculptor mould to uh, sort of about half a pint of water and you should whip it up um, to the consistency of cottage cheese. It's a very easy product to work with and using a wallpaper as, wallpaper as trowel, it, uh, it goes on quite easily. I find one of the best tools is just to use your hand, just wet it down and rub the sculptor mould kind of into the crevices. And after about 20 minutes, when the sculpt mold starts to go off, again, if you wet your hand and you rub the surface, then you can take out all the little bumps. And of course, the more you rub it, the smoother it becomes. So if you want to do a roadway or something like that, then you just keep going until you get the surface you need. Clearly I need to find a solution from where the river will end uh, coming out of this scene. So I thought, well, we need to, I need to seal it, but also there needs to be some kind of board across the front. So it's off to that famous DIY store, Block and Quail. And with a piece of MDF, I trimmed out the shape that will need to go onto the front of the board.
and as well as being much more aesthetically pleasing, of course it will protect all the soft uh, foam from any damage. Of course there's bound to be a gap when you fit it, so what should I use for that? Well, this time I've opted to use cork. Um, and cork is a very useful product because it's a kind of a DIY product and uh, it will glue almost anything to anything. But before I fit the board in place, I thought I'd better make a decent seal uh, across where the river uh, ends, the, ends on the scene. And so with the filler in place and then replacing the piece of MDF, I then filled uh, the gap with decorator's cork. It's easy to smooth off, just wet your finger and then rub it along the line. Of course, we can't just leave it uh, in that horrible buff colour. So just using a very cheap uh, poster paint uh, from a children's kind of art shop, I then put this matte black on. Of course, when it dries, it doesn't look quite so deep, but it's a hell of a difference and finishes it quite well. Next is to uh, just paint over uh, the decorator's cork and that doesn't take long at all. And again, I've just used, um, this is a brown paint from uh, a sort of hobby craft type shop. And I think it's now looking much better. I bought this little Fordson farm tractor the other day. When you pop it in the scene, it really shows how big the viaduct really is. I mean, this tiny little tractor is actually dwarfed by the scene and it just shows, you know, how imposing it really is. Well, that really is most of the uh, forming of the land all done. So what's left to do? Well, obviously I've got to do the epoxy resin on the river, but I'm actually waiting for a sealant because um, I don't want to get any leaks. So I want to make sure um, that the riverbed is sealed probably before I do that and I haven't received the sealant yet so that's probably going to be the last thing I do. So in the meantime um, I can ballast in the little farm track now um, and then a case of greening up all this hillside. I could use the woodland scenic scatters, the, the fine turf, burnt grass and that kind of thing on here or I could of go to the static grass. But to put static grass in such a major expanse, I don't think it would work because it would, you'd lose the de definition of perspective because obviously this is sinking away into the distance. So what I'm going to do now is put scatter over um, all the fields and then um, start on the hedges and trees and try to work out where the shrubs will go. And obviously the infill um, within the viaduct with bushes and all the stuff that would grow in there, brambles and that kind of thing. And also other stuff along the roads. I've also got fences to put in um, and barriers to put in up here. Um, so I'm kind of halfway through, so on we go. To hold the scenic materials in place, I always use undiluted PVA. The fine gray ballast was uh, a product that was left over from a previous project so it was ideal to use this and once it's weathered in I'm sure it will look absolutely fine.
one subscriber made a comment that the farm track shouldn't actually go alongside uh, one of the piers, it should actually run between them. And he was quite right and I moved it accordingly. So it now runs in the middle of the piers. It's neat mod podge on this hillside and if you watch closely it's about to cost me this t-shirt. There it is. I've opted for Woodland Scenics Blended Turf Green Blend T49 on the whole of this hillside on the left hand side um, except for between the arches where obviously I will put put in kind of uh, brambles and, and other materials but blended turf is going to go on the left hand side and that's the stuff that I think the sheep would eat down and give it the right sort of colour. It might seem somewhat wasteful but all of the excess will be hoovered off and recovered later. And one of my wife's old stockings is the ideal uh, medium to pick up all this waste and allow you to recycle and get it back in its jars. I was advised uh, again by one of the subscribers in the comment section that I should really seal the riverbed using flex paste. So I ordered this pot, uh, flex paste C1205. Um, to be on the safe side, but I'm not too sure that I would have actually have needed it, but perhaps better safe than sorry. And I used a one inch brush to lay it down and um, that probably wasn't the ideal way of doing it because um, the way I've done it, you, you can't help but leave dust, uh, brush streaks embedded in it. And uh, I think it would have probably been better do to um, just kind of stipple it towards the end. I had a couple of friends come over uh, a few days ago and um, between us we picked the board up and put it into its final position just so I could size up um, how we would do the transition from the viaduct board back into the hillside. So I'd made up a couple of uh, rocks with the old rock moulds a few days before um, and I was just trying to see how I would manage this transition. So deciding upon which rock I would use is then a case of just trying to mark it out on the uh, on the new board whereabouts it would go um, and also to measure what sort of drop we'll have to do from one board to the other. I must confess that when you pop this little tractor in it just looks so tiny. The jury stood out regarding that bridge I painted over the flex paste again with uh, the two colours that I'd used previously which was the ballast grey and the black brown and now with an airbrush what I'm trying to do is just make the transition somewhat fainter to give the river a sense of depth. I'd sized up a couple of rocks and uh, sort of figured out where they would go and pop them in position. one in front of the viaduct and one behind. Of course, before you pour your epoxy resin, you'll need to make some form of dam to stop it just running off the edges. 
and I've used uh, just an ordinary white uh, paper tape. I had thought about using a rubber tape, but I thought, well, no, I can't do that. It might well react with the epoxy resin. So I used the paper tape and then reinforced it with um, black masking tape to give it some rigidity. Of course, when you do your river, make sure that the boards are level. As you can see here, mine isn't. It's kind of a bit down at the front. Um, so I had to jack that up before I started pouring in the epoxy resin. And also just to make sure that it is um, spotlessly clean. There's no dust in there whatsoever. So now we get to the scary bit, mixing up the Envirotex light. It comes in two bottles. And the thing to be very wary of is cross-contamination. You've got to keep these separate at all times. The instructions are very precise on the mixing times that you should stir them for uh, two minutes and then decant it into another vessel. So I've marked out a level on two uh, identical beakers and I have a third beaker um, that after I've poured them in, I can mix it and using these old wooden spoons from a cafe, I then decided to saw the ends off them to get rid of the round ends so that the square ends would be able to get right in there to make sure it is thoroughly mixed. And the instructions do keep emphasizing this. So the current plan then, once the beakers are marked out, so you get the precise level of the, of the, uh, the chemical in, in each, you then pour them into a, one separate container and then carry on from there. So out comes the, uh, the protective rubber gloves and we start to measure. I must confess I found this whole process quite unnerving. So you repeat the measuring process exactly the same on this for the second uh, chemical. And then make sure you keep them separated and the bottle tops are back on. So now you mix the two chemicals together. And get out as much as you can. Now the quantities I've used here, I've just kind of guessed. There is no real formula. Um, and as it happens, I should have mixed up a little more. And every time I finish with something like those beakers, they go straight in the bin. So we now have to mix this together for two minutes. And I wanted um, to give it a little bit of colour. Um, and I thought, well, as there's a, a large blue sky uh, backdrop I would use a drop of blue just to give it a little hint. I'd watched another YouTuber and uh, they had problems having put too much of this dye in there that the Envirotex light then wouldn't solidify so I'm very cautious here on how much to put in. As it happens I should have put more in because it wasn't really uh, showing its colour. You do need to scrape the stirrer several times and then make sure uh, that you uh, make sure you scrape all the sides of the, uh, the plastic beakers to make sure you are getting a thorough mix. And then you mix, you then pour that mix into another container and then carry on stirring for a further minute. I must apologize now for kind of putting my hands in the way of the camera as I'm pouring um, the epoxy resin in, uh, but it's a case of really of just trying to get it into a, the nooks and crannies and it should find its own level. As I said, I really should have picked, uh, mixed up just a little bit more uh, 
to give it a little bit, a bit more depth. And at the other end there, I am struggling uh, to get it to cover completely. And with the last little drop, I wanted to make sure that I had a, a, a decent amount at the front, because obviously that's the, that's the area that's more visible. It's crucial to remove the bubbles from the mix and the best thing to use is a cookery blow lamp. Now my wife has one for doing things like creme brulee and it is absolutely brilliant. And all you do is just uh, you know, slightly brush it over the top of the Envirotex light and the bubbles just disappear. And then finally, just before I call it a day, I put a piece of hardboard over the river to make sure that there's no dust falling on it as it dries overnight. Well, I must confess, the following morning I was absolutely delighted when I walked back into the room. It was like a complete mirror and I was kind of mesmerised by it really. It obviously does find its, uh, its level and you can see the true reflection of that uh, viaduct pillar in the uh, in the Envirotex light. It is brilliant. Of course, I don't really want it to be like a mill pond, so we've still got some work to do. Removing the, the paper and the masking tape, and you could see that there was a very slight leakage of the epoxy resin, as you can see that dark patch at the end. So it was clearly worth, uh, you know, ensuring that we had a good seal. And then this can just be simply rubbed down and then painted black. And there is a tiny little lip across the uh, resin. Well, it's now 48 hours since I laid the Envirotex light uh, river, and I must confess, I'm very impressed with it. It is just like a mirror. Of course, that's not quite what I'm after. So what's gone wrong? Well, um, I didn't quite mix up um, enough quantity. And um, so in, in some places around one of the rocks, this is a bit kind of thin. It's not going to be a problem because shortly I'll be putting a ripple down the river and you won't notice that at all. Um, I did put some blue dye in and that really hasn't shown through. I wanted more of a sort of a, a murkiness to the water and you can't really see that. Um, what could I do? Well, I could do another mix and put another layer down, but I don't really want to risk messing up what I've already done and I don't have that much confidence. When I did the river, I was absolutely cacking it. I really was quite nervous about screwing this all up because if I did make a complete mess, you know, you can't sort of take a chisel and, and, and rip it all up. Um, but as we are, I am very pleased. One thing I can't emphasize enough is the removal of the bubbles. Now I know it wasn't quite obvious in that uh, previous piece of footage um, of how to remove it with the blowtorch. Um, I've been back into my wife's kitchen again <clears throat> and I borrowed my wife's Cook's blowtorch made by Ernesto and uh, being the bargain hunters that my wife and I are, we bought this for $9.99 with the gas canister from uh, Aldi or Little. It was one of the two, it was one of their little bargains. And the incredible little device that it is you simply cock it by pressing this little button down, press the button and it bursts into life. I hadn't, I deliberately hadn't done most of the Phoenix, the Scenix at this stage because the last thing I wanted to do was wave a blowtorch um, around the river and then obviously if I had static grass or reeds and all the rest of it, they would simply go up in smoke. So that's why I've held back. So what am I going to do next? Well, I think the next thing to do is put the, the, riv the ripples on the river and to use that I use a gloss, if I could find it, a gloss Mod Podge, which I'll show you shortly, um, <clears throat> and then work my way through there. I use an airbrush to, to put the Mod Podge on um, to give it that kind of ripple, but it's not an essential, but you would, I think, get a better finish with it. So let's get the Mod Podge out and crack on. So using Mod Podge Gloss Luster and a flat brush, you decant it onto the, uh, the riverbed. And I was doing sort of three to four inches uh, at, a, at a time and uh, 
just try not to put too much down or too little and then with an airbrush then set to the wrong pressure because this is set to about 12 psi and I later found out really that you need 25 psi I then worked my say my way um, up the river and it all kind of worked out quite it's quite easy really there's nothing nothing too serious um, you may be able to see uh, some of the air bubbles but using the airbrush tends to get rid of the air bubbles as well so uh, it, it is recommended if you haven't got an airbrush then I'm sure you could uh, sort of borrow one or whatever this is a very very cheap airbrush that I bought as a package I don't intend to use it now for when I respay locomotives it's just to do small weathering jobs um, well such as when I did the river and I tried to blend uh, uh, the river in with the basalt grey So cover it up and away we go. So while the Mod Podge is uh, drying off and it should take around about 20 minutes, but because it's quite thick, it may take an hour or two before we can go back and have a look. I thought I'd just bring you up to date on, on the scenic side. Now behind the rails, obviously when the, uh, the module's against the wall, it'd be very difficult to carry it, those bits of scenic. So what I'll have to do is um, finish that bit first before I put it against the wall. And just clearing this workspace away, you might be able to see, this is the two part mix of the Envirotex light and I only used that kind of much. So I've got lots left in the, in the packet and obviously I can use that in the future for ponds and everything else. So we'll keep that away and tucked away. But just remember if you buy these, these two part mixes is just make sure you don't cross contaminate them or they will be written off. Trees are always an issue, aren't they really? And I've knelt at the altar of um, Woodland Scenics for these tree armatures. And I've used these in the past and hopefully up here, there'll be a video to my part two on trees where I used these before. And this pack is either the, sorry, the five to seven inch trees. And you know, it's not rocket science, there's an armature. And all you do is you put it into this little base, you twist it around and you can fit um, clump foliage. And if you want to do that, then there really is only one glue that I find you can use, which is hobby tack adhesive. And you paint this onto the, to the branch ends um, and it's white. When it goes clear, it's at its tackiest, if that makes sense. And then you can stick your clump foliage on. For me, that's not quite good enough. That sounds awful. It's not quite what I'm after. And here's a tree I made previously, and it is again one of the um, Woodland Scenics armatures. But what I've chosen to do with it is I've glued onto it sea foam, which I've done to this one last night and it's just a case of um, with that uh, hobby tack I coated all the ends um, once it had gone off I poke the uh, the sea foam on and hopefully it will stay on what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a drop of super glue on the joins just to give it that extra bind what I also did last night was this one here and this is the the nine inch tree um, and uh, I super glued all these bits of sea foam on and hopefully you can see that it doesn't look that good um, and you can see all the branches and everything else so what I'm going to do with this um, in a few minutes is I'm just going to get some Halfords primer the grey primer and prime the bottom of the tree trunk kind of bits then I'm going to blow a coat of um, black uh, kind of emulsion primer over the whole branch structure and then come back to you. So whilst these are drying I'll just show you how you nurture these tree armatures into that kind of shape. Well I mean, it couldn't really be simpler all you need to do is with a scalpel take off the, the, the kind of the flash marks and the rest of it and all you need to do then is spin them and twist them into a spiral shape and the branches kind of fan out and you can design your own tree exactly as you like it. And then, as I said, with the hobby tack type glue or just straight super glue, is you build up your foliage. So 
I mean, they really are quite simple. They're not the best tree in the world, you know. It's not like building your own wire structure trees, but for decent trees, um, for the background, then you can use the sort of clump foliage because they're out of the way, or um, let's say a nice tree in the foreground, which hopefully that large one will, be, will become in the first field on this uh, viaduct scene, um, sort of like a, a prestige kind of tree, for want of a better term, then um, if you add the sea foam, that's how you get on. So I'll clear this away and then we'll wrap some foliage on. So my glue choice, I've either got 3M photo mount or 3M display mount. There's not too much left in either of those. And the reason I use those is I find that um, the spray glues from, uh, from, what was it, from Hobbycraft and those kind of things really don't, um, they're not a permanent fix. And the hairspray, I, to be perfectly honest, um, some people can get away with it, I certainly can't. So what I'm going to do firstly is I shall take this little tree outside, I shall spray it with um, the photo mount and then come back in and whack some leaves on it. And the leaves I've got here, sadly, these first two bags are from Tremendous. Tremendous, lovely. Um, but they don't have the name of the leaves on the, on the packet top but we are where we are. One's a kind of a mid-green, one's a bit lighter, and I've also got a bag of darker green from Gage Master. Anyway, so what I'll do with the first one, uh, this, this first the smaller tree, take it out, spray it, bring it back in, and then throw some of that over it. So I'll see you in a second. Okay, hopefully you can see that it's a, kind of a gray color now. And when we sprinkle the leaves on it, the magic happens. One of the tricks to do is try to avoid spraying the glue on the trunk and if you do, which I invariably have, is to, uh, is to scrape those leaves off. And <laughs> how about that for a tree? It's just so straightforward, really. And as you can see, not a lot falls off. I'll just take a check it over. All we could do is a little bit there. And uh, it obviously looks quite dense as well. But as trees go, I mean, that's cracking little job. Well, I think it is. Now the difficult one, so I shall clear this away, rebag some of that, and then crack on with the larger one. Okay, same routine, just with the larger tree, and again, it was the brown um, 3M display mount. So here we go, let's see how we get on. This stuff does come hurtling out of this packet. It's an adventure for us both. This, I've never used this uh, this stuff from I think it's Gauge Master before. And the advantage of using the sea foam rather than the clumps is trees are a lot more open than kind of we give them credit for, I think. Um, and the, it might seem odd that I use Halford's grey primer on the trunk, but go and take a look at trees and see how many trees that you can find with um, brown trunks. I mean, they aren't really. They're either kind of grey or fawn. But there we are. Right, so there's my tree. I think it's rather dapper really. It's a little bit heavier here, but then that's not a big deal because I can just take a pair of scissors and trim that bit in. If I can take off any loose stuff and then have a good look around it. And it's looking great. And then what I'll do just to finish with is I shall um, just sprinkle some lighter leaves um, on the top to give it that kind of look of sunshine. 
and that, that tree there will probably go in the, well, one of these trees will probably go in the middle of that field um, out front. So hopefully, whilst the, um, whilst the Mod Podge is drying, you've learned something about trees. So the following day, there's the dry Mod Podge ripple on the river, and I think it looks rather nice. All I need now is a pair of canoeists. And getting back to the landscape, I'd coated all the, all the landscape uh, with Mod Podge and then added three different scenic scatters. And that's where we are now. I picked up a load of rocks um, when we were out walking the other day and I thought they'll do nicely once I've washed them off and you can see where I've super glued them into the foot of the cliff face. To secure it all down of course you just need just uh, need some uh, IPA as a wetting agent, some uh, isopropyl alcohol and then some scenic cement and I've made some out of Mod Podge uh, mix with one part Mod Podge and three parts water and that kind of keeps everything secured um, so it doesn't kind of just blow away really because it is quite thick. Moving on now to the uh, to the scenics where it will go against the wall and I obviously have to get all the hedging done before it goes up against the wall and using a paintbrush and Mod Podge wasn't the best idea. And later you'll see me using a, a small uh, nozzle type container which works out much more much easier. Using bits of lichen to change colour of the, of the hedge so to make sure there's some variety in it and this is one of the two trees that I made up yesterday and I think it fits in there very well and the hedgerow starts to take shape. Variety is always quite important and it's just trying to see where things would naturally fit and, uh, and, and for this I did put a load of paper towel over the river because the last thing I wanted to do was get scenic cement um, onto the riverbed to, to sort of dull it so I made sure we don't, that, uh, that doesn't happen. And then gluing all these various bits of bob that I've acquired over the years to give the scene some variety. I think the cliff face is starting to look quite nice now but of course you can always add to it as you go on there's no need to get it all done in the first burst and then two gun Tex comes along again with his IPA and his scenic cement and gives everything another good uh, soaking and then my masterpiece of a tree well hopefully um, I popped it in the landscape to sort of make it sort of a, a, a prime sort of aspect for it and uh, I think it sits in there quite well So as we take a final look across this diorama, I would hope you agree that it's looking reasonably good. I must confess I'm pleased with it, although we clearly aren't at the finished stage. In fact, there's an absolute ton of work left to do. I need to um, spray the track, uh, ballast the track. Um, I need to build up this landform here so it fits in um, with that other hillside. Um, I've got to, let me think about this in the right order, um, put the fencing across um, the top here. I've got to do that piece of hillside there, the fencing on the back. The fencing um, around the farm track needs to be done. So as you can see, there is, there is hours and hours of work left to be done. But as far as the video is concerned um, with this particular project, I'm going to call it a day here. And so what did it cost me? Well, it's cost me two t-shirts um, and there's the, uh, the mark on the second one. So make sure you wear rubbish gear when you're doing this kind of mucky modeling. Um, the products I've used, um, are I, I, don't, I haven't made many mistakes with these products, um, but you really do need to tread carefully, especially with the Envirotex light and those type of epoxy, um, epoxy? epoxy resin products. Um, you know, they, they are sort of, you, you can be quite vulnerable mixing them up and getting them wrong. I've kind of landed on my feet, perhaps um, I was quite fortunate, um, but we kind of, we are where we are. Uh, scale wise, I'm quite excited about when I start to put farm animals in because I'll probably go for HO scale um, uh, cattle on this field where it will be 
uh, double O on the front so you get a, a feeling of perspective and hopefully you can see that tree being bigger than that one kind of gives you a sense of scale so hopefully it all works and it's no longer I think just about the viaduct. The viaduct just happens to be in a hillside and you kind of get the feeling that the hillside was here before the railway which is obviously what you try to portray. So there we go. Um, there's not a lot else to say. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and hopefully you've subscribed. Please leave any comments below if you like it, if you like the bridge. I've been, we've been there before with that one, that small um, farm track. Um, but if you've got any, any, any points for me, please leave them. I try to answer every single comment that's left, um, except for the ones that contain swear words because I instantly delete them because it's a channel that's suitable for the under 18s. Um, it's been a, it's been a blast doing this and I thank you my subscribers um, for sticking with it because without your kind of inspiration that leads me on you know it kind of takes the shine off it but because you've been there every step of the way and it and it's been a lot of steps I think this has taken me the best part of 12 months when I first started gluing this old Pico viaduct together but there we go so and ending, as usual, I thank my patrons enormously for their support. If you haven't subscribed, you should be ashamed of yourselves. And there should be video here and here. I'll see you in a few weeks. I've got to work away. I've got down to McKinley next week. Um, and hopefully there should be a link coming up to here for McKinley. And that's about it. Catch you later. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>